think during my summers at, at college, I would read the stories of Horatio Hornblower, a naval sea captain, uh, stories by uh, Scott Forrester, at least that was the name on the book. Uh, since learned that his real name was Cecil Smith. I guess if your name is Cecil Smith, you look for <laughs> another name. In any case, uh, these seagoing adventures were uh, amazing to watch or, or to observe and uh, were a great blessing uh, to read. Uh, Smith himself, or Forrester, had uh, attempted to serve in the military for Great Britain, but was refused because he was too thin. He uh, was athletic enough, but just was not built enough to serve as a soldier. So he went off and, and uh, served uh, in the United States as something of a, a British uh, promoter of the war. Anyway, he has a fascinating insight into uh, the movement of ships and the, the, the care of ships, and as you read this account here in Luke's Gospel, you see that Luke also had a minute interest in the, the uh, shipping industry and how ships set sail. You can see him tracking the ship from port to port, uh, taking advantage of islands and uh, sailing south of the island to use the island as a buffer to protect the ship from the winds coming from the north or from the west. And so uh, Luke tells us these incidental things that Somebody who had a really nautical mind, a mind fascinated by ships and sailing, would take note of. It's a, a lengthy journey, and uh, eventually it, it begins first uh, at Caesarea, where uh, the centurion is responsible to take Paul uh, off to Rome for trial. And Felix was happy to unburden himself with Paul and his trial or his case. So the centurion escorts him, and apparently Luke travels along with him because we pick up the first person uh, reading here, we going along here and there, and we endured this. And so Luke apparently is on board the ship with Paul, and so also is Andronicus from uh, Thessalonica, another uh, disciple who was very faithful to Paul and endured many sufferings with him in the course of his ministry. So these traveling companions are with Paul. Uh, Sir Ramsey, in his uh, uh, comments on the, this text, notes that, in, in his opinion, it's possible that Luke uh, and, and uh, his partner traveled as servants of Paul under his uh, ownership, if you will, uh, which uh, would account for the presence of their, their welcome presence there on the ship, but it does seem a little bit odd and perhaps disingenuous for Luke to be a slave or servant of Paul. Uh, I rather suspect that they were simply welcomed along with Paul because of the esteem that the Roman government gave to a Roman citizen, and to Paul in particular, and Luke uh, was able to travel along with him to observe what was taking place. As they make their way on towards Rome. They come to a port where uh, it's not a, a very uh, safe port for winter and they have to make a decision. Will they stay here or make a move off and, and take a chance to go to Rome? And the decision is made against Paul's objections. Paul has done a number of travels at sea already to this point. You might note in Corinthians he says that um, he had been shipwrecked three times and spent a day and, and a night in the deep. So Paul knew something about shipwrecks and knew about sailing. Uh, but the centurion, along with the independent businessman who was running this ship, the captain of the ship, uh, agreed to, to set sail again against Paul's objections. Now, when you look at it on the surface, you've got to say, well, surely the ship's captain knows what his ship can handle. And he, being an experienced sailor, he knows what to expect in terms of the weather and uh, whether it's safe to make their way off towards Rome again. But Paul said, no, we put everything at risk if we set sail here. But against Paul's advice, they went on their way. Of course, uh, 
Uh, they had fair weather to start, but that quickly turned against them, and the storms came upon them. As I look at this story, and, Paul, and Luke's fascination with nautical things, uh, another thing that strikes me about that is how when the storm comes in, they put ropes underneath the ship to tie the ship and secure it so that the wood on the ships doesn't buckle and fall apart. There are all kinds of these interesting side bits of sailing that Luke re records here for us to help us kind of, as it were, sit in that boat with him and understand what's going on, under get the feelings of the terror that was overwhelming the sailors and the, the uh, passengers. In any case, why does Luke record all of this? What are we to learn from this event? It seems to me a number of things uh, become apparent. First, at the center of this text, in about the 24th verse or so, you have Paul standing up before the ship, saying that he had received a vision from an angel. An angel met with him at night and told him that everyone on board the ship would be saved, but the ship would be lost that they would have to run aground on some island there and uh, make it to shore. This is at the center of the whole story here. The story revolves around this assurance that Paul gives that everyone will be saved. And I wonder if Luke isn't trying to give us something of a, a if you will, a, a metaphor for God's great work of salvation. How there is... A, a tremendous work of God in saving God's elect from the storms of life and from indeed destruction. And God will safely bring his people, all of them, to his eternal kingdom. Not one will be lost. Uh, I remember C.H. Spurgeon had a sermon years ago uh, in which he talked about uh, the, the travels of Israel out of Egypt off to the land of Canaan. And Pharaoh wanted them to leave something behind. And Moses said, no, nothing will be left behind. Not even a hoof will be left behind. All the people of God, all their cattle, everything will make that journey to the land of Canaan. And I think it's just these different ways in which God gives us pictures of the work of redemption. And of God's special work for his people. And bringing them all safely to their uh, heavenly shore. You are in God's hands, and you can take comfort in that. I think there are larger uh, other issues that the, the text brings to our mind as well. Uh, this in particular, uh, Paul is there on board the ship with a variety of sailors and, and soldiers and other prisoners, and other perhaps passengers and merchants and what have you. Some 200, was it, 270 different people on board the ship there. Obviously not all of them Christians. Uh, maybe just Paul, Luke, and, and, and Andronicus. I, I don't know if there were any others. Uh, but God nonetheless spared all of their lives for Paul's sake. Why is God so gracious to mankind? Why does he bring them safely through the troubles of this life in many respects? Well, it's because of his people in their midst. The church has a saving effect on the world around them. God's people have a, a, a sanctifying influence on those who are around them. Uh, we noted this in our study in Corinthians where Paul says that when you have a mixed marriage where one member of the marriage becomes a believer but the other does not become a believer, the unbeliever remains within the marriage and is happy to stay married. And, and Paul says the believer should not leave that unbeliever but stay in that marriage because the unbeliever is sanctified by the believer's presence. That doesn't mean the unbeliever is saved, but there are blessings and benefits that are extended to the unbeliever because of the believing spouse. We can look at that more broadly in a culture. The culture flourishes and prospers because of the presence of God's people in its midst. Remove those people and the culture begins to implode and collapse. We seem to be seeing that very much at work in our world today, where much of American culture is, in many respects, walking away from a sure foundation in the Word of God 
and the way of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone, and is embracing a polytheistic worldview, a kind of pantheistic world in which everybody's right, and everybody's happy, and everybody goes to God. And we all should be tolerated except those Christians who say there's only one way to heaven. And so our culture is seem to be on the a path towards implosion as the culture descend, descends into all kinds of immorality. But God's people are salt and light in the world. They are a sanctifying influence to the world today. And so maybe that Luke was giving us something of a, a picture of that in this work. Another thing that you might note in, in, a, in this event is uh, the providence of God in governing the course of events. Uh, Paul, in his sanctified reasoning, saw that winter is coming. The, the, this trip was taking place probably sometime in October, so winter was on its way. Uh, it was said that uh, in, in various uh, charts, uh, seafaring charts, that uh, the seas got dangerous in September and were impossible in November. So here we are in October and taking a trip. Now, God rules the winds and the waves. He has all things under his control. And he controls that ship which has an apostle of the church on board. Now, the Lord in his providence might have given them clear sailing. He might have held back the storms and allowed them to pass through safely without a problem. But God allowed the ship to go through heavy seas and stormy winds. So much so that everyone on board thought they were going to die, including the most experienced sailors on board. And Paul was on board. God is pleased at times through his wise providence to allow his people to go through very hard circumstances. When the winds and the waves beat against our little ship, and all seems lost. And you wonder, why is God allowing me to do this? Why is God putting me through this? Well, he has his purposes. He may have lessons to teach. To teach us individually, and to teach the church at large. God governs the course of history and controls all things. There are laws that undergird the course of history that cannot be changed. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that in Christ all things hold together. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17. In Hebrews chapter 1, uh, the, the writer there says that uh, Christ has been exalted and upholds all things by the word of his power. The course of history, the, the, the laws of science and of this world are all governed by God and His Word. We have special revelation given to us in Scripture for our salvation, but God's general Word goes out throughout all of creation. And so whether you are looking at science, medicine, art, uh, all kinds of things, they are undergirded by the laws of God which can only be resisted for a period of time before you get brought, brought back to center. There are moral laws that govern life. There are moral laws that govern the family, the state, the church. And when you resist those laws, eventually you face catastrophe. Only the Christian has a sure foundation for exploring the world around them and observing its laws and how it functions and operates. Only the Christian can be assured that the sun will rise up the next day, or that one season will follow after the next. When you abandon an all-wise creator who governs all things by his word of power and set the world loose on a sea of chance, then you don't know what can happen next. Really, a chance universe has no laws, nothing to guide it. 
To my mind, that's why Christian cultures have advanced so far as they've had in medicine and all kinds of things, technology, science, because they understood that there are laws that you can depend upon, that you can discover. There's God's providence that controls all things. We live in a world governed by God. And what is more, finally I'll say this, we who are joined to Jesus Christ have a renewed heart and renewed mind, which enables us perhaps to be a little bit more perceptive, should be, about what's going on in the world, or to resist the kinds of pressures that people in the rest of the world face. Because they don't have a hope in God, they don't have God's word to guide them, they don't have faith that God will secure them. And so the Christian should have a sanctified common sense that recognizes the authority of God's law and his responsibility before God's law. Paul was not a sailor, he was an apostle. And ordinarily, you would trust the judgment of the sailor with regard to the course of that ship. But Paul understood the law of God. Paul understood the responsibility to save life. Life was precious. The Roman soldiers didn't have the same concern. When it appeared that the prisoners could escape, they were all set to kill them, to save their own skins. There was no moral system there of any value. But Paul had this sense that we are made in God's image, and life needs to be preserved. And so therefore, he took a more cautious approach towards what he foresaw as coming towards, the, towards them in the way of a storm. God gives you a sanctified understanding of the world and guards you from the various pressures that are on. The, the centurion was under pressure to bring his captives to Rome. The, the ship's captain was under pressure to bring his cargo to port. Um, there are all kinds of these pressures on these men. But Paul was pressured by the word of God. The importance and value of human life, human life, as opposed to material things. The godly man, the man who fears God, is a man who develops prudence, mature judgment. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, 22nd chapter, verse 3, Proverbs says that the, the prudent man sees a danger coming and avoids it. He sees what's coming and he makes proper preparations. He sees that he's going to be old someday. So he sets aside a retirement account. He sees that he's not always going to be healthy, so he has some health insurance to protect him. He sees that uh, all kinds of things. He sees what's happening in the world around him, the culture that is around him, and he acts to try to change the culture. He sees what's happening in the church, the various trends in the church, and he speaks up and proclaims God's word against a church that might be going astray. Prudent people see what's happening and stand up and make changes or get out of the way. Has God given you a prudent, God-fearing heart, informed by God's word, instructed and disciplined by scripture, so that you can see and understand how you should look on the world around you and act accordingly? Paul was guided by this sanctified understanding. And Paul was right. The men were saved as they listened to his instructions. Don't you see something of the cross being pictured here in this chapter, in Paul's sufferings? I mean, here he has this uh, meeting with the, the men. He gives thanks to God among all these pagans. He upholds his Christian faith and enforces his Christian faith on them by giving thanks to God in their presence. Were they all believers in Christ? Did they not all probably have their own pagan gods or no god at all? Yet Paul stands up before them, natural as can be, and says, let's give thanks to God. Then distributes that bread. Live as Christians in a fallen world and expect the unbeliever to live accordingly as well. It's their duty to give thanks. If they don't, they need to repent. 
and change. So Luke tells us this amazing story of the apostle at sea, facing peril, distress, and trouble, but they finally make it to land. There are all kinds of troubles that we face in life that come our way. This Mother's Day, there are all kinds of pressures that come on women. All kinds of challenges that you face today to maintain your role or that of your parents as women who are mothers. Raising a family in this world today is a great challenge. You have the great sweep of relativism, socialism, uh, and now gay marriage sweeping across our culture, taking many folks away. The news media, the entertainment media, the educational system is all sweeping many away. And godly women trying to raise their children in this age have a great challenge before them to remain true to God's word in the midst of a decaying, corrupt culture. What will you do? How do you stand against all this? You can stand because you have a sovereign God who controls the winds and the waves. A sovereign God who will bring you through each trial in each trouble. Whether it's a child that's sick or uh, your husband out of work and needing a job and not enough income coming in or all kinds of things that can put pressure on you. All kinds of troubles that we face. But you have a sovereign God who loves you. Uh, I'll conclude with this. And I know it's getting late. Uh, one uh, pastor in commenting on this text noted that he performed a funeral just prior to this for a young woman who died, I believe it was in a swimming accident, maybe a pool or a creek or something like that, but she drowned. And the text that was read during the, the, the funeral service was uh, the text from Isaiah, though you pass through the deep waters, I will be with you. And the, the pastor noted, you know, we go through these deep waters and God doesn't necessarily promise that we'll pass through them alive in this life. But it does promise that he will be with us through the waters. God may have been pleased to take Paul's life at that time. That might have been the end for Paul. But God was with Paul. And he will be with you if you rest in him and take you through the most deepest waters of life, even those of death itself. I will be with you. Sovereign God. And death is no problem for him. He rose from the dead. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that your spirit would bless the ministry of your word to our hearts. May we live by faith. May we look at the world today as a world governed by your sovereign word. And may we, with prudence, hear your word and live God fearing lives to your glory and praise. We ask it in Jesus' name.